Thank you, Fred. Um, it's always a pleasure and honor to be in this ANFA conference. Um, let me see. Okay. Yeah, so circadian rhythm doesn't need much introduction because we all know that almost all life forms on our planet evolved on this rotating 24 hours day and night cycle. And over the last few million years, to adapt to this light dark cycle, almost every life form has evolved to have circadian rhythms or a daily timetable of chemical processes that happen on a uh, repeat of, uh, itself in every 24 hours. And these rhythms are controlled by circadian clocks, which are encoded in our DNA. And these are so essential to our existence that if we lift humans, plants, or animals from this planet and implant in another planet whose light dark cycle is not exactly 24 hours, then this life form will not thrive in the other planet. And how do we know that these rhythms are real? Because if you, again, isolate me in this room with sufficient access to food and water, and a bed, then my, I will go to bed around 10 o'clock. My deep sleep will happen around 2 o'clock in the morning. Anticipating waking up around 5 or 6, my core body temperature will begin to rise. After I wake up and I'm exposed to light, my, my melatonin will drop, my cortisol level will rise. And in the morning, um, my insulin sensitivity is much better. High alertness happens around between 10 and 12. And then muscle performance will peak in the afternoon. And in the evening, my body will again begin to prepare to uh, go back to sleep. So this happens on a daily basis. And in fact, one hallmark, the key hallmark of being healthy is to have these rhythms. And when you disrupt these rhythms, then diseases happen. So these rhythms essentially fall into three major classes. Um, those are the foundations of health, sleep, nutrition, and physical activity. And we know that circadian clock regulates all three aspects and also disruption in any one of them disrupt the clock. So in that way, it has a reverberative effect on the rest of the system. And sleep and nutrition are also under homeostatic control. And then the entire system is under light dark cycle. So in that way, there are quite a few things that are interacting here, sleep, nutrition, physical activity, light and dark, that also regulate a uh, rhythm and core body temperature. So in the context of this, what has happened in the last 150 years or so? So our ancestral rhythms were very different. We had pure access to, <laughs> access to pure dark. Um, or in the evening, we had access to very little of firelight. During daytime, there was a lot of bright light. Uh, there was opportunity to sleep for almost eight to nine hours. Physical activity was plenty during daytime. And the opportunity to eat was also limited because of the limitation in food and also um, there was a lot of activity to take care of. So things happened um, over 150 years ago when industrial revolution brought electrical lighting that lighted up in the evening. Food production and processing happened so there was plenty of food around and infrastructure which is essentially a method to a framework to move people, product, information and waste from one place to another with minimum physical activity, um, reduce the opportunity to exercise. So as a result, the modern rhythms are very different. Throughout 24 hours, we sit in dimly lit room like this. We have opportunity to sleep for very little time. Physical activity is very reduced. And then there is a lot of opportunity to eat. <laughs> so in fact, as long as our eyes are open, our mouth is open. So this causes chronic circadian disruption. And in fact, if we um, if we put a baby, newborn baby, in, in circadian disrupted environment, of course we don't put that, but at least from animal studies we do that, we know that then there is lifelong impact on impaired growth and development. And just few nights of losing sleep will cause, some, uh, cause these discomforts, these are not disease, but then if it continues for several days, weeks, or months, then there are nearly 150 or 120 different diseases that have been linked to circadian rhythm disruption. So these disruptions can be disruption in activity sleep or uh, eating pattern or a combination of both of these. And these diseases go on increasing as we age. So the science of circadian rhythm is essentially figuring out how circadian rhythm disruption 
lead to some of these diseases and how we can reverse them or maintain them by three major aspects. How do we improve the rhythms by behavioral or structural changes? How do we time the drugs and how do we drug the clock? The one in red are the ones that affect more than 10% of the target population. So that means 30 million Americans in this country suffer from any one of these diseases that are in red and the ones in yellow affect more than 5% of the population. So then, uh, what is the basis of circadian rhythm? And the good thing is uh, my pre previous speaker has already introduced this. Just like our brain has a clock, uh, almost every organ in our body has clocks. And that means this brain clock sends diffusible and synaptic signals to synchronize all of these clocks. And as a result, we get daily rhythms in sleep, mood, metabolism, and even our gut microbiome cycles on a daily basis. And this entire system is linked to the outside world, mostly through light received through the eye. But then these light sensors are not our typical light sensors that we use for visual response. And that was a surprising finding that we made almost 14, 15 years ago. What we found is melanopsin, which is a opsin-like or rhodopsin-like molecule, is a blue light sensing protein and is present only in 5,000 squiggly neurons of the eye. And these are directly hardwired to the master circadian clock in the base of our hypothalamus. And these are in fact some of those melanopsin cells in the mouse retina. And these have a very different characteristic. They are less sensitive to candle light and particularly less sensitive to orange light. So as a result, in the past when there was firelight or candlelight in the evening, these cells were not active. So the circadian clock could, could rise melatonin at night and we could go to sleep well. And during daytime, bright daylight activates melanopsin, synchronizes the brain clock, raises alertness and de reduces depression. But over industrialization, we have changed. We actually live indoor. So as a result, what happens at the night, we have bright light and bright screen that confuses our circadian clock. And in the daytime, we have gloomy indoor days. So it misaligns circadian rhythm, reduces alertness and increases. Uh, we have foggy brain. So insomnia and foggy brain continue for many, many days or weeks. And then that can lead to a lot of different brain or mood disorders. So as a result, there is an idea that we can change lighting to promote health because light now is not just for vision, it changes our hormone level, it changes our stress level, etc. So that's, uh, so there is a good opportunity to change lighting. So I just published a book uh, called The Circadian Course, so some of this is already there and this is also a conflict of interest. Um, so then the question is, what is shift work? Because the title of my talk was shift work. If you look at the European uh, definition of shift work, uh, working for two to three hours between 10 o'clock and 5 a.m. for at least 48 days in a year is shift work. So that means if you just think about for a second, you know somebody or maybe some of you yourself are shift workers because there are essentially seven different sets of shift work. The traditional shift work, seasonal circadian disruption that happens in winter days, in northern latitude, shift work like lifestyle, like high school students, college students, architects, and scientists. And then jobs in gig economy, um, jet lag, the true jet lag, many of you actually travel more than uh, 15 times or 20 times in a year. So, and along with other lifestyle, you are actually a shift worker. And then social jet lag, when in the weekend, you attend conferences or have a guest at home, and you stay awake for more than two hours after 10 o'clock and digital jet lag when you have a collaborator or a client four or five time zones apart and you have to wake up early or stay late. So is it uh, really what we are seeing? So a few years ago, we started a collaboration with uh, uh, Horacio D. Iglesia from University of Seattle, uh, sorry, it was in UW at Seattle. And we put these active watches on Toba Indians from Argentina uh, that re records activity and sleep as well as light. So this is the first time when there's watch recorded five blocks of light. This is the sunrise sunset time. It's very aligned to light dark cycle, natural light dark cycle. That's 50 blocks of light and this is 500 blocks of light. And these tobas, they go to bed around between nine and 10 and wake up exactly at sunrise. So now look at data from a Seattle high school student wearing the same identical watch. And now this person, this high school student goes to bed little after midnight and wakes up a little after sunrise to go to school. And this is the standard deviation over 14 days. There's a big spread, compare that to the spread here. 
this is another high school student. And when these high school students come to college, then things get worse and worse. So essentially, almost all of us, every one of us, we're sitting here, have experienced that kind of shift work. Uh, so this is uh, some of the activity pattern from Tobas and uh, high schoolers. The only time high schoolers get a uh, um, chance to exercise is when they go from one class to another class. And another interesting thing that we're finding is, um, so this is the light level in Tobas, experience a spike in light just before evening. So that's the time when they're coming back home and taking care of stuff. And this is when we are actually experiencing low and low light and that continues. So we think there is some, something to think about that evening light, how we trans used to transition from very bright light to dark and now we are going from dim light to dim light. And then there is also an uh, interesting difference between weekday and weekend. So, similarly, so the bottom line is we all are shift workers and we've got to think about how we manage this. So this is the lux level during weekday and that's the lux level in weekend for these uh, students. Uh, so our lab has also developed a very simple lab called My Locks Recorder so that you can uh, download it and use this to figure out how much, roughly how much light you have. It's roughly linear up to say 2000 locks and beyond that it's not linear. Um, so with that, we have collected this data. So the bottom line is at night time, there are many places that are very brightly lit. And during daytime, there are also places that are very dimly lit. So those are the, those are so, some of those are here. So when in the evening, so what I'll do is I'll stop whenever you stop me because <laughs> So why light is so, so why not having access to darkness in the evening is so important? Because light at night can keep you awake. So you're losing sleep, but at the same time, when you lose sleep, it increases hunger and it also disrupts our normal judgment about food. So we tend to eat more energy dense diet. So by both keeping us awake and, and making us eat more can lead to all of these problems. So the only way we can control this is either to dim down the light or manage light in a way that will inhibit us from staying awake or eating food, or we can uh, voluntarily try to eat less. So um, in fact, what we're finding is um, <laughs> if you peer into bright uh, homes at night time, that's what you see. And when food is served at the wrong time, then in addition to those two perturbations, what happens is now food takes over the entire rhythm. So every time we eat late at night, it disrupts and it makes the system think as if the morning has come again. So that's another circadian disruption that happens. So I'll not go through it because uh, you'll see um, the key slide is coming up. <laughs> the bottom line is a um, few years ago, we did a very simple experiment where we took two sets of mice. One set of mice ate whenever it wanted to eat. The other set of mice actually was trained to eat only for eight to 12 hours during the preferred nighttime eating because mice are nocturnal. And what happens is random eating of the same calorie leads the mouse to become obese, diabetic, and all these diseases happen. Whereas number of, by controlling the same number of calories from the same food source, if we feed them within eight to 10 hours or 12 hours, then the mouse remains healthy. And in fact, we can reverse this disease by forcing this mouse to eat eight to 10 hours. But this is only in mice, in control condition. We cannot do that to human. I mean, we, are saying, we, we try to do this to human. And in fact, what we are finding is, when we give this general suggestion that you should sleep for eight hours, and then after waking up, wait for an, for an hour or so and start eating, and you can eat for eight hours, 10 hours, or 12 hours, not more than 12 hours, and then try to uh, avoid food and avoid light for this period of time. Although this is the recommendation, what people do is slightly different. Uh, they tend to sleep around midnight because there is so much light at night that it's very difficult to sleep early. They wake up with a lot of drive sleep, a lot of sleep drive, so instead of waiting for an hour, they actually drink a lot of coffee and then start eating. But even if they try to adopt a eight hours time restricted eating or 10 hours time restricted eating, it is not easy in the absence of control, in the absence of um, other stimuli that come from light and other stuff. So for example, during daytime, there is not enough light in many office spaces to make them alert so that they don't need that morning coffee. And in the evening, there is also a lot of light at home that keeps them awake. So I'll just leave it here and then maybe we can have discussion during the break. Thank you.
for one one question, please. Yes. Far side. <coughs> Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. It was fascinating. Uh, someone who travels a lot, so I'm one of the shift workers. Um, the hotel industry has recently added what looks like a strobe light in your bedroom over your head. Um, I can cover almost every other light, but I'm not supposed to do the, that one. How do we help the architectural engineering design help us sleep when we're already sleep deprived in that kind of setting? Yeah, so, it's, so as you can see, this is a pervasive problem because uh, what we're losing is our right to darkness because and uh, the common trend, the, uh, the popular trend now is to brighten up the room as much as you can, bring in daylight, put LED light, but what we're losing in this process is our right to darkness. And that is becoming more and more important because we are not driven by day-night cycle anymore. Each one of us should be able to create our own light-dark cycle and should be able to have the freedom to completely darken the room even after, even during the daytime and take a nap. And this is something I want to leave with because we've got to start thinking about how to bring darkness. Just with a flick of a finger, if I can lighten up the room with another flick, I should be able to completely make this room dark. And that hasn't happened. Thanks very much. Thank you. Fred, we have to move on. Uh, we have the panel with upcoming Allison. Uh, and those who are a part of the panel, please 